give you an, an idea uh, around things. And if there's any questions that you might have, um, we'll, we'll, we will have a Q&A and a discussion after this. So fee please feel free to join. So I am going to hope that this works. And hopefully, let me get a thumbs up from Jennifer. Can you see that? Yes. Okay, great. So for me, we call this Homie's Iliad, but Iliad as gangster rap. And um, the Iliad is a poem uh, for me, which is which has um, stuck with me for a very long time. I tend to read it uh, every other year, and I get inspired by it for for many different reasons. Now, those of us in higher education who write poetry, which is which is many of us here, we always wish to um, either have produced in us or to produce in others what we might call the aha, right <laughs> reaction which occurs when one experiences enlightenment. But of course, we know there are others that also induce us toward poetry. And that is ug, disgust. There's also grr, anger or offense. Awe, empathy or pathos. There is also the ha ha reaction when we experience humor. Well, this lecture came by fruition of the what the f reaction. This reaction was brought on when some years ago, I was listening to a lot of right, right wing radio, don't ask why. But that was when I heard shock jock Don Imus make his nappy headed hose comment regarding the appearance of the athletes on the Rutgers women's basketball team. Now many people were calling for Imus's immediate dismissal while others were calling for him to stay. This sparked many discussions concerning censorship of both language and subject matter slash themes in American popular culture. One host, Jay Severin, argued with, uh, agreed rather with Imus, saying that he lamented that he should be fired while so many so-called gangster rappers whose lyrics promote misogyny and glorify violence are allowed to continue unimpeded. Mr. Severin and others, when um, defending Mr. Imus, cited the then popular film, Hustle and Flow. It was a film that was featuring a Tennessee pimp who tries to turn his life around by becoming a gangster rapper. Now, Mr. Severin, see if I can move past this because we don't have the time for it. Now, Mr. Severin spoke about how, how this piece, again, which, which features a Tennessee pimp who tries to turn his life around by becoming a gangster rapper. Mr. Severin blasted the film for its soundtrack um, featuring songs like that hardcore driven testosterone infused whoop that trick, which is about, about um, an individual having to fight. Now I'm gonna pr presume that most of us here have not seen that film and I'm gonna give you some idea of the lyrics in it. So, I'ma make these suckers recognize. Now this is saying, this is coming from the main character. His name is DJ. And that's the individual who is trying to get out of the life of being a street hustler and into something a bit more legitimate. I'ma make these suckers re recognize I ain't playing, yo. If you violate off the top trick, you gotta go. I done held in a lot of shit. Now I'm about to flip. Now I think it's time to show you bitches who you fucking with. Ain't no love, yo. Just bring it through the dough. I'm number one and let my nuts hang to the flow. So if you want some, this is your death wish. Better come correct because I came to break you off trick. Now, like many, I too share concern over our society's infatuation with what I call a sociopathic psyche with a penchant for rhyme. But I did think, however, I found it odd that certain media neocons who, even though they earn their livings making pejorative statements, and two of these guys are mercifully dead, would firstly attempt to sign on to Mr. Imus' uh, attempt to blame his use of the word hoes on an adolescent musical genre, and secondly, espouse that such gangster rap lyrics and stated themes are barbaric omens that portend the demise of Western culture. Now, when I heard this, I laughed out loud and said, hey, dude, have you ever heard of the Iliad? <laughs> now, of course, there are glaring differences between the Iliad and gangster rap. No one, I hope, will be reciting the lyrics to whoop that trick in 3,000 years. But there are also some glaring similarities. First, the Iliad, being an epic, functions as an encyclopedia of a culture. Epics are often complex glimpses into a culture's ethos, pathos, worldview, virtues, and values and vices. And gangster rap often gives 
the same glimpses into the lives of the culture from which it springs, both because of their both of them because of their pervasiveness have been used to instruct largely adolescent males for good or ill as to how to behave in what both cultures see as a pointless world of despair and imminent violence. Alexander the Great was raised on the Iliad and was actually told to model himself after Achilles. Now, the mind of Iliad knows that one's Moira, your time among the living, has been predetermined by capricious gods with little or no regard to what we would call ethics or morality. Your Moira or fate cannot be altered, and no matter what you do, will ultimately you will ultimately end up as a dehumanized nothing consigned to the darkness of Hades, the underworld, or Tartarus. The mind of gangster rap has accepted that one's fate is determined by the state, by police policies based in racism and often brutally brought about by the whim and attitudes of a societal elite. Just think of those women we call Karens and that the societal and cultural forces are constituted such that immediately all one will be offered is premature, ultimately rather, all one will be offered is a premature death, either before, after, or during one's consignment to prison, a dark place where your humanity is also diminished. Second, both the Iliad and gangster rap are linked to the culture, to the concept of warriorship. That is, there are circumstances in which violence is justified. Note the words of the previously cited lyric, whoop that trick. If you violate off the top, you gotta go. If you violate, this is conditional and culture determines what those conditions are. The man who fights when he must fight theme has been a seductive cultural trope for millennia and evidently, we moderns are still seduced by this, by this theme, given that films in which justifiable violence occur are far and away among the highest grossing films in box office history. Now, my wife, along with a slew of women friends I have had over the years, are feminists who eschew displays of male violence and honestly admire men who solve conflicts through reason. However, on a few occasions when I've had a couple of adult juice boxes, I have asked the following question. Let's just say you were in bed with your man and you heard a loud noise downstairs that awoke the two of you. And your man crouches down in the corner and says, baby, there's somebody downstairs to go see who it is. Could you honestly tell me that, this, that deep in the recesses of your well-educated yoga trained Birkenstock minds would not lurk the, ind the indicting query? What the hell kind of man are you? Out of the 13 who I'd asked this at the time, only two said that they think that would not be their reaction. I take them at their word. However, the women of both ancient Greece and modern gangster rap culture harbor little doubt as to what they expect of a man if he is desirous of getting with them. So both Iliad and gangster rap focus on the violent conflicts occurring between individuals when one violates the cultural code, the unwritten cultural laws that facilitate social interaction. And Paris violates the code of Xenia, the law that governs the guest host relationship when he hot foots off to Troy with Menelaus, who was his host's wife, Helen. After having taught in prisons, I can tell you that a consistent story incarcerated men tell of how they ended up there has to do with actions seen as violations of manhood by some other man disrespecting them in front of their girlfriend or trying to mack on or make out with their girlfriend. Time allotting, we will, we will revisit this. Another point of comparison is that both the Iliad and gangster rap are part of oral culture and as such utilize rhythm and to frame content. Gangster rap is usually performed in a meter framed by four, four time with accented first and third beats. The rapper combines voice and timbre and rhythm variation of melody often to form his or her what we call flow. And flow is all important because if an MC has no flow, the listener won't care enough to listen for content. Now, how the MC delivers divides 4-4 four, four time is very important. The bass in gangster rap is very important as it connects rhythm and melody and often dictates how the hook is going to be heard and how it's going to hit. 
The Iliad uses variations of a dactylic hexametric pulse, long, short, short, long, short, short syllables. What to us in English would be an accented syllable followed by two unaccented syllables. But often the bard would add either a trochee or an accent or, a, uh, or an accented syllable followed by an unaccented one or a spondy, two short accented syllables. And thus the bard could vary his delivery. Next, let's turn our attention to theme. The epic's main theme is apparent in the Iliad's opening line, which in English is sing, goddess, the anger of Achilles, Peleus's son. But as I said, this is the English translation. In its original, the line reads, Notice that the first word in the original language is the word manen. Now, manen, which is a form of the word manus, is translated as wrath, rage, or most, most often anger. Now, this word, this word, right, um, ang manus typically describes the anger of the gods. That is an anger or wrath so profound that it is going to result in many human deaths. That manen is used for Achilles' anger suggests and predicts that it will have an extremely bloody aftermath. And of course, we see in the Iliad, it does. It has always been of interest to me that, uh, that the first word of the longest extant complete foundational text we have in Western culture should be anger. One wonders, has this set the tone for Western interactions throughout history? Are we the inheritors of that violence? Is this in our cultural DNA? If it is, then perhaps we have no choice but to sing it. Perhaps we don't know how not to sing it. Now, take that need to sing of violence and combine it with our modern American consumer culture and further combine those with an American sense of belligerent individualism. What is gangster rap, if not primarily an individual singing his anger, his desires for goods, and the violent consequences of crossing or dissing him? If instead a bard asking the muse, in this case Calliope, to sing through him about Achilles' anger, if a modern day Achilles were to sing of his own anger and prowess using the popular song meters of this day and the technology of our times, would he be considered a gangster rapper? To explore this, I created a persona rap titled Sing the Rage, in which Achilles is a gangster rapper named MCA Kill. And just as Achilles' anger and his aftermaths are repeated themes of the Iliad, I have apportioned, uh, appropriated and adapted the Iliad's opening line to serve as the repeated hook or phrase between the lyrics stanzas. It is now main and naede thea Achilleos. Do you imagine a bunch of Greeks throwing up swords, going man and naive that they are Achilles. And Achilles, uh, 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 Achilles comes out, he addresses the crowd. Yo, everybody knows that I'm the greatest warrior in Greece. And when I kill a man, I kill a man with skill and ease. See, I don't think about it or waste a lick of time to everything a purpose and making war is mine. See, I don't go for no coward ass way of taking a sucker out from some point far away. It takes steel nerve and a set of brass. You know what's to look into a man's eyes when you spill his guts, then strut across his corpse slash another one and not to give a damn if he's an elder or an eldest son. You see, if you just don't want to get killed, it's simple, baby. You stay up off my battlefield because this here is real. This is the warrior class. We get ill on an enemy's ass. It takes three things to be a man, man, a chariot, a chick, and some blood on your sword hand. Man and I ate it, they are Achilles. And we can see from that that MCA Kill is a 12th century BC GWA, Greek with attitude. And he wants his talents recognized. Anyone who has read the Iliad knows that the desire for public recognition of his greatness is at the heart of Achilles' anger. The warriors in the Iliad frequently boast of their prowess, attributes, or pedigree, glory of the Achaeans, best of the Achaeans, and so forth. And so does the bard. Achilles is swift-footed, leader of men, sacker of cities, godlike. Now, the hooks of my persona rap 
mention two important concepts, kleos and time, or glory and honors. A warrior's kleos or glory is determined by how he would be, it determines uh, how he would be remembered after death. To receive kleos, he would need to be so brave in battle that poets would want to immortalize him in song. In other words, he needed street cred or rep. The last two lines of the first stanza, you need three things to be a man's man, a chariot, a chicken, some blood on your sword hand, refer to the ancient Greek warrior's investment in time. Time or honors comes in the form of geras or bling. It is the tangible booty or war prizes warriors bestow upon another warrior who has distinguished himself in battle. The bestowing of Time or of Geras is a sign of a warrior's mark, his rank amongst his peers. These tangible honors may take the form of weapons, armor, chariots, or the most prized possession of all, of course, a conquered enemy's daughter or wife. In other words, a trophy bride. In the beginning of the Iliad, Achilles is angered because Briseis, his Geras or war prize, given to him by the group has been taken away by, from him by Agamemnon, who after having his own war prize, Chryseis taken away says to Achilles, are you to keep your own prize while I sit tamely under my loss and give up my girl? Let the Achaeans find me a prize or I will come and take yours. And Achilles answers, you threaten to rob me of the prize for which I have toiled and which the sons of the Achaeans have given me. So we see here that Achilles is on the beach and he's angry and upset and pounding the ground. And the woman coming up out of the waters is his mother, Thetis. Mother Thetis, she'll, she'll come back in a minute. So what I would do at this point is I would wanna turn your, your attention to a film clip, which I can't really play right now for you right now because I'm trying to save time. And this is a movie that was iconic back in the 1970s. It was called The Mac. And the movie um, uh, features a, a bunch of hustlers. At this point in time, they're in a place and what they're doing is gambling. And this guy uh, on the left uh, with, the, with the leather jacket and, and no shirt on, his name is Pretty Tony. And he was just bragging about his ability to both make money and control women. Now this flip, as a, this film, as I said, had a huge impact on gangster rap culture and has been, uh, been used several times, uh, has been said several times on albums. Now, what happens in this film is that, is that a woman named China Doll, who is a prostitute working for this guy with no, with no shirt named Pretty Tony, goes up to Goldie, who is called the Mac, and says, does, 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 anyone, need an, um, an, um, does anyone need uh, an audition to get with you? He says, no. She says, then I choose you. And Mr. Pretty Tony gets upset about it. And so, and so uh, the Mac, Goldie says to him, Mr. Pretty Tony, you know the game. She chose me. Now we can handle this like some gentlemen or we can get off into some straight up gangster shit. Well, let's just say the gangster shit did occur. Now there are, oh, I won't be doing it. There are of course differences between this scene and what occurs in the Iliad, but there are some striking ones, some striking echoes. First, Paris and Helen. There is always some debate as to whether Helen ran off with Paris or was abducted against her will. It didn't matter to Menelaus. He was insulted and therefore his honor had to be satisfied. But both Briseis had no choice but to be firstly given to Achilles, a misogynist warrior, and secondly to Agamemnon, a misogynist warrior. Perhaps it mattered very little to Briseis because whoever she was going to be given to, her fate was to be consigned to being a sexual slave. Now we see a mixture of those situations if you saw it playing out in the Mac. The woman, as I said, China doll leaves one pimp, Pretty Tony, uh, who is a misogynist exploiter, who will offer her sexual services for money and chooses another misogynist exploiter, the Mac or Goldie, who will offer her sexual services for money. Now, this brings us to another other themes in the Iliad, betrayal, wounded pride and revenge. First, I'll perform part two of Sing the Rage. Now we come to the sandy beach of Ilion to keep a promise that was made to Agamemnon, whose brother Menelaus had a party at his house, invited Paris over, had a spouse in Paris stolen. And so to get revenge, we sailed the blue Aegean because what Paris pulled was a diss to all Achaeans. And even though my goddess, mother, my goddess mother's own prophecy predicted death would be waiting here at Troy for me, I still came to bang with my Myrmidons, 50 ships, bodies ripped, rough and ready to get it on. We burned whole towns down to the ground, then went 
went from place to place, robbing, taking any women that we found. Cause it's the warrior's privilege. It's the warlord's right that we be given women when we prove how well we fight. But Agamemnon, who's forced to give his woman back, sets his eyes on mine to make up for what he lacks. I should have known he was a double crossing SOB. Should have known he tried to pull this kind of jazz on me. But what what did me in was how my so-called friends didn't bat an eye, say a word, and they helped him take away my war prize. Now, I don't give a damn how many of them bastards die, whether they end up dead from swords in their heads or if they get debauled by a Trojan lance instead. I don't care if they fall like rotted dogs, give their soul to Hades and give their flesh to dogs because teammate and playoffs are the names of the game. You take them from a man, it's like you deflate his fame. I swear that I won't fight until my my ship is in flames. You better fear my anger. Even gods know my name. Maine and I aided. They are Achilleos. You better believe it's about Fime and Cleos. Just as the names of gangsters and gangster and gangster rappers often indicate some aspect of their history or personality, i.e., the Mac, Pretty Tony, DJ, 50 Cent, Scarface, so too do the, do the names of the Homeric heroes. In her lecture, The Paradox of Glory, Professor Elizabeth Vandiver points out uh, the same about Achilleos. Achilleos is possibly a contraction of akos, meaning grief and agony, uh, or agony, and the aforementioned kleos, or glory. This would signify that Achilles' name could suggest the grief or agony of the pursuit of glory, or the agony that the pursuit of glory can cause. Homer calls Achilles as grief causing anger, that destructive wrath which brought countless woes upon the Achaeans and sent forth to Hades many valiant souls of heroes and made them the spoil of dogs and every bird. Finally, we get to Philos, love. Though the warrior or gangster has no love for the enemy or apparently for women either, he seems to be often wrought with a strong sense and affection of comrades. And in the cultures of both Iliad and gangster rap, you often come across men mourning the loss of companions. To my brothers who ain't here is frequently heard during hip hop performances and on albums as well. Little Wayne in his rap, I Miss My Dogs, exhibits Philos when speaking of his friend, Turk, who died violently. And you see, he says here, you was my homie, my nerd, my, my joy, my herb, my main, my, for you, my man, Turk, my other, my partner. I was teacher. He was father. I skilled. He schooled. We chilled. We moved. We thug. We hung. We ate. We slept. I lived. You died. I stayed. You left. In book 17, when Achilles finds out that his friend Patroclus, often described as gentle Patroclus, has been killed battling Hector, Achilles recognizes that Patroclus' death is a direct result of his withdrawal from the fighting out of, out of wounded pride. The Iliad tells us that a dark cloud of grief uh, fell upon Achilles, that he fills his hands with dust from off the ground and pours it over his head, then flings himself down and tears his hair out. M.C. A. Kill addressed this sense of homieship in the final stanza of seeing, of seeing the rage, which I will read now. Now, the only man here that I know that I can trust not to stab me in the back is my man, Patroclus. We go way back to when we both were little ones playing childhood games in the warm Greek sun. Gentle and kind, Patroclus knows my mind. Not a better warrior could any, not a better friend could any warrior find. And I swore as a child, and it's a vow that I meant, whoever harmed him would be violently sent to the world of the shades by the strength of my blade, where all is forgotten as the memories fade into something too horrible for men to speak of. And next to Peleus, my father, it's Patroclus I love. So please say that it's not so that my beloved Patroclus has gotten taken out by Hector. Now he's out there kissing dust. Oh shit, I feel so alone now. Get my armor, Murmur Don, because it's on now. What you mean Hector's got my armor? What? He took it off my boy and now he's out there on the strut? Call my mama. She's always got my back. She'll hook me up with some new gear and then I can go get on that ass real fast. Let me tell you, it'll be a pleasure to kill Hector, to pay him back measure for measure, to stab him in the heart, watch his blood bloom like a flower the hour I sent him down to the undergloom, then later on to desecrate his Trojan face as a warning to the whole of the Trojan race so that his friends and his family and his people will know that to avenge my friend that I would overflow every room in the dark house of Hades. This is what happened happens when you anger Achilles, Maine and Naedi, they are Achilleos. You better believe it's about Timae and Cleos. A Maine and Naedi, they are Achilleos. You better believe it's about Timae and Cleos. Warning, blatant soapbox moment. 
Our nation has was founded on the enslavement of one people, the blood of another, and the systematic disenfranchisement of women. And unless we recognize this fact and continue to honestly address these inherent faults, we have little right to expect more from modern popular culture. If art indeed reflects a nation's image, we would profit more from truly examining and changing the image of ourselves than we would by continuing to curse the mirrors reflecting us. Thank you for listening. And next up we have Jennifer Clairvaux. Okay. Uh, let me see if I can get the screen share working. Reggie, do you see that properly? Okay. Um, thank you so much to Mary and the New England Poetry Club. Uh, it's a pleasure to be part of this conversation with Reggie and Cami. Reggie, that was fantastic. Uh, I, maybe I want to steal some of those aha. Uh -huh, uh, <laughs> sure. Uh, uh, sure. And I'm going to be thinking a long time about the idea that the name Achilles might have compressed inside of it uh, the words for glory and for grief. That's just, I love that kind of uh, discovery. So thank you for all of that. Um, what I'm going to share is uh, work I'm in the middle of right now, uh, poems responding to the Roman poet Ovid. So we'll move more than a thousand years later than Reggie's Homer, uh, in particular to sections of his book length calendar poem, The Fausti, where he retells the old Greek story of Demeter and Persephone, or Ceres and Proserpine, to use their Roman names. My poem is partly a translation of the Ovid and partly a commentary on the challenges and discoveries of the translation process itself. I want you to feel a charge, uh, Reggie's aha. I want you to feel an aha, like the one the story gives me, but I hardly know where the charge comes from. And the poem is my way of trying to figure that out. Here's an illustration from Dallaire's Greek myths, uh, where I met the story as a child. Um, I love how much of the story is compressed into one picture. On the left, you have Persephone falling with the flowers that she picked falling from her hands. Then there's Hades or Dis as he's also called with his horses carrying her down into the dark. The pigs falling over the edge with Persephone. Uh, and especially this drastic cut between the sky above and the underworld below. If you look really closely, and I'm not gonna try to mess with the screen share here, but if you looked really closely, you could see on one side, little unpicked flowers hanging on at the rim and way in the distance on the other side, a tiny figure with arms up in dismay. So that's one kind of uh, translation of the story uh, visually. Um, and I think a really popular translation in the 60s when I was a kid and carrying on into the present. And I know it stays with me and it's part of the backstory of this. There are many contemporary poems based on this myth. Evan Boland's Pomegranate in a Time of Violence gives us one version. It starts like this. The only legend I have ever loved is the story of a daughter lost in hell and found and rescued there. Love and blackmail are the gist of it, Ceres and Persephone, the names. And the best thing about the legend is I can enter it anywhere. That's how it begins. Uh, Louise Gluck in her book, Averno, which means underworld, offers a number of versions of the story, uh, highlighting that in the first version Persephone is taken from her mother and the goddess of the earth punishes the earth. This is consistent 
with what we know of human behavior. It's kind of a dry, um, but powerful take. And then a later poem in the same volume, in the second version, Persephone is dead. She dies, her mother grieves. The problems of sexuality need not trouble us here. Uh, there are many other books. Rita Dove has a whole volume called Mother Love, riffing on the story from a variety of angles. And lately I've heard Maggie Dietz read some really fantastic poems she's working on from the Persephone story. Almost every one of these poems includes uh, not just the appeal of retelling this story, uh, but of rediscovering a well-known story too. So I guess that's partly what's in this for me in working on the Ovid. It's not just to retell it, but that I keep discovering things. And I'm thinking here of what Italo Calvino in his essay, Why Read the Classics, suggests, which is, I'll just read a few of these. Um, a classic is a book which, with each rereading, offers as much of a sense of discovery as the first reading. And I think that's really true, even if you're not digging into it or researching it. Um, I'd also say the poem rereads me, that I never feel like the same reader twice. Uh, he also says, your classic is a book to which you cannot remain indifferent and which helps you define yourself in relation or even in opposition to it. And I, I like that. Uh, uh, I like that description because it's not about a kind of dutiful discipleship or apprenticeship, but you're not indifferent to it. Um, it stimulates some kind of response, which also helps you uh, define yourself. Uh, classics are books, the more we, sorry, classics are books which the more we think we know them through hearsay, the more original, unexpected, and innovative we find them when we actually reread them. The classics are those books which come to us bearing the aura of previous interpretations and trailing behind them the traces they have left in the culture or cultures or just the language and customs through which they have passed. To find your own version, you have to dig through the layers. Uh, and that's something that I've been doing with this poem. So I've been obsessed with Ovid's Fosti lately. It's more of a puzzle than his beautiful, much better known Metamorphoses, a strange book. It's like an almanac, highly miscellaneous, celebrating but also investigating a calendar that was relatively new in Ovid's time. Rather than focus on stories, Ovid here is asking questions about the conventions, traditions, and rituals of the calendar itself, secular, agricultural, political, religious. If you opened it up to May, for example, and the first of May, he speculates on three different possible reasons for naming the month May. Is it for the goddess Maya? Is it derived from a term for majesty? Maybe it refers to the elders, the maiores, as June refers to juniors. All three of these names suggest different things we might value and celebrate on the 1st of May. Ovid peels back to expose the layers. There's no one answer for him, no one source. The more possibilities, the merrier. We all put things together in different ways. At the heart of the book, are questions about the ways such calendars, really calendars of any kind, help us try to locate ourselves and our communities in cycles of time and change and loss. This particular story from the Fasti leapt out at me because of its emotional impact in an often disorienting book. And because it's different from the version he himself has already told in the Metamorphoses. The story had an unexpected charge that I wanted to pass along. Honestly, I still haven't finished the part of the story that shook me the most, but I'm trying to lay the groundwork to get myself and my reader there. If there's time in the discussion after, I could say a few words about that. But here are discoveries I made along the way. 
The story is told mostly visually, like a movie going from a distant overview to minute focus on particulars to locate us in the scene of events. We begin in a vast rainbow colored world and we end in darkness. Two, the emotional impact of this scene is auditory, carried in the calling out of names and ending in silence when those cries aren't answered. So those are two things that really struck me as I read it over and over. And I wanted to try to zero in on that. But as I wrote my own response, I couldn't tell, am I translating this? Am I doing a translation? Am I sticking to it as a translation? Or should I give up on that and focus instead on my own questions? Ovid's example of asking questions and opening up possible layers gave me a model I thought I could try to use. So the section I'm gonna read for you I've, I've, I call nameless flowers. And there's an epigraph um, from Elizabeth Bishop from a journal entry. Uh, she's writing from a house in Maine she's renting for the summer. And she starts to catalog her surroundings, consulting guidebooks on the birds, on the pebbles on the beach, and on the wildflowers. Then this, there's this note uh, that really caught my attention. She says, I want now now that it's too late to learn the name of everything. That's the quote, that's the epigraph for it. I want now, now that it's too late to learn the name of everything. And that uh, example wanted to get put with the Ovid and to launch this story uh, and to help us think about the way that knowing names brings us close to things uh, and a name can memorialize a loss and make it acute. So I'm gonna read to you, let me see if I can switch the screen share. Stop that one. Switch to a new one. Uh, now, can you see, can you see a poem called Nameless Flowers? Great. I'm, I'm going to read this poem and I think finish with reading it. It's about three pages long. Uh, I may say just a little bit right at the end. And if there's time to talk more about the calendar project, about translation, about disruptive or layered translation, um, we can come back to that at the end in the discussion. Um, this poem was uh, published uh, last year in, in Literary Matters. So, Nameless Flowers. I want now, now that it's too late, to learn the name of everything. This is the place, here, in the field, in the year, the sequence, the page, that calls for the virgin's rape. You know the basics of this story, O oh, writes but some of the details will be new to you. The film might open with the opening of an antique book of maps turned to Trinacris, three cliffs jutting out into the ocean. Let the camera pan out over Henna's many cities, her fertile fields of faithfully tilled soil, then slowly zero in on the chilly spring of Arethusa. Let us hear as we move closer the inviting waters calling the goddess Ceres. Her daughter, with her usual companions, wanders barefoot through the meadow grasses, a shady valley damp with clouds of spray from water cascading down. All of the rainbow colors in nature flourish there, the ground radiantly dappled with myriad flowers. Moving close up on blossoms, Voiceover, the daughter exclaiming to her friends, come on, come with me, let's fill our skirts with flowers. Medium long shot, beautiful silly activity, the patterns of girls absorbed in work in the fields. Not work, an absorbing game, filling their baskets woven out of willow 
or heaping blossoms into their tucked up skirts, their loosened robes. Multiple moving close-ups here on marigolds, violets in the viol be violet beds, a stalk of poppy plucked between the fingertip and thumb. Let the camera linger on you, Hyacinth, you, Amaranth. Some love wild thyme, some clover, reaching for heaps of roses, nameless flowers. Look at their leader, gathering delicate saffron, white lilies, lost in what she's reaching for, desire leading her away. Gradual crossfade, girlfriend's voices hush. Slow Dolly back reveals the girl alone in the lush field. He sees her and seeing takes her. Wipe the screen with darkness. Her uncle carries her away down to his kingdom with his blue black horses. Her cries rip through the air. Mother, quick, help me. I'm being taken away. Dress torn half open, earth itself torn open, a path for Dis, his horses, bucking and veering away from the alien daylight. Meanwhile, her friends, with their heaps of flowers, are calling to her, unaware. Persephone, come see what we have for you. Then register, they're slowly registering her silence, her absence. And then their howling fills the hills. Her name echoes in the air above their howls. This is what Ceres finds when she arrives, stunned by their lamentation, then instantly crying out in misery, daughter, where are you? Let the camera wheel in distress. She is swept away out of her mind, like a manid, exactly as the saying goes, with wildly streaming hair, like a bellowing cow, calf ripped from her udder, ransacking the landscape for her child. She roars in pain and rushes through henna's fields. A girl's footprint, then another. Ceres knows the weight that pressed those tracks into the dirt. That day might have seen the end of her wandering, but pigs had trampled back and forth over the trail. And here, the pages of my book threatened to fall out and away, to lose themselves. Of four translations, it's the oldest and most crisscrossed with markings in three different colors of ink, underlinings, commentary, digressions, post-its, three whole odd placeholders, a program from Itati, Reflections on Narcissus, Art and Nature in Early Modern Europe, and Measuring Hell, a Florentine debate. A close-up photo of the Mooney lichen growing on the temple stones at Sardis, and a cardboard paint sample from Benjamin Moore, Persian Violet, Violetta Persa. But doesn't that sound like Violet Lost? On the cover of the book, Detail from spring, first, Rome, first century Roman fresco from Stabiae, now in the archaeological museum in Naples, where I recognized it. Golden haired girl in yellow and white robes turning away to pluck a flower between fingers and thumb. Hadn't we seen the walls at Stabiae riddled with holes, their frescoes torn away? Tear out the pages cast them all away into the outer darkness. There is no place Ceres goes that does not fill with wailing, as when the bird mourned Edis, her lost son, cries in the dark, Persephone and daughter, each name in turn, the alternating cries, but Persephone can't hear Ceres, daughter can't hear mother, name after name fades out and dies away. The camera searches the faces of those she sees, shepherd, plowman, whoever. We hear Ceres asking her one question. Did a girl, any girl, pass by this way? All colors die down to one shade. Now shadows cover the world, and now the watchdogs all fall silent. Here is something obscured by the translations. We never hear her name till she is gone. Uh, and maybe I'll leave us with one more thought from Calvino, who says, all that can be done is for each one of us to invent our own ideal library of our classics, 
And I would say that one half of it should consist of books we have read and that have meant something for us. And the other half of books which we intend to read and we suppose might mean something to us. And then I love it given that he's got both halves covered. He says, we should also leave a section of empty spaces for surprises and chance discoveries. Thank you very much. Turn things over to Cami. Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, I'm uh, very thankful to New England Poetry Club and to Mary for setting this up for us. And um, it's really a pleasure to be here with uh, Reggie and Jen. Um, Reggie, I wanted to thank you for making such a for firm connection between 2,700 years ago, give or take, and now. Uh, and uh, you'll see how I'm drafting off of that a bit. And uh, Jennifer, um, you said the poem reads me. And uh, if, I, if I get to the end of my talk, you'll see exactly how uh, relevant that is. I'm gonna talk about sound here. I'm doing kind of a technical thing. I'm gonna be kind of a DJ and I'm gonna run four songs or poems past you. Um, I have a longer handout that explains uh, and translates and things. And if you're interested in that, uh, just email me and I will send it to you. Uh, what I'm going to show you is a kind of an engine of English poetry that we've had around for a long time and that we can tap into. Some of you already do, um, but even if you're not a poet, you can still listen for this engine uh, running. I'm gonna begin a thousand, a mere thousand years ago, hardly any time at all, um, with Beowulf, uh, the anonymous epic, talk about warrior culture, uh, which is written in Old English. I'm not gonna really talk theme here, but I'll just say the big topic is how to defeat the monsters that are threatening our world. That's what we have to do. Brief plot summary for those of you who may not have read Beowulf within the last week or two. Beowulf, the prince of the Geats or the Yats, sort of the Swedes, uh, comes to help the king of Denmark. His kingdom is being threatened by this terrible monster, Grendel. Beowulf, uh, against whom weapons are useless. Beowulf kills Grendel. Peace descends for a moment. Then Grendel's mother shows up. She lives under the lake. And when she shows up to the castle, it's even worse. Beowulf eventually dives into the lake and kills her. 50 years of peace, yay. And then comes the dragon, the inevitable dragon. And Beowulf fights the dragon and kills the dragon, but is also mortally wounded and dies himself. And then is you know, raised up into fame. Uh, and the main fame, of course, is this poem. Beowulf is not a historical person, although other people in the poem apparently are. Okay, so that's 3,000 lines. We're just gonna do 15. And I'm really just gonna look at them for the sound. Um, you'll see that the poem, even in this little segment, mixes pagan and Christian. It's the first moment when we meet the monster Grendel. And Grendel is compared both to elves and orcs and giants, and also to Cain, as in Cain and Abel. So you have a pagan past and a Christian past. And uh, he is uh, like Cain. He has been cast out to roam on the earth. So I'm going to um, screen share so you can see that. And then I will just read you a little segment of Beowulf. I'm gonna give you a moment's explanation of, of uh, how this verse works because it's important in everything we're going to do after it with the other three songs. If I can get this one for you, we'll, uh, we'll be well off. All right, so this is just a few lines of Beowulf and at this moment when Grendel shows up 
And just to say the old English is on the left, the new English is on the right. The new English is a, 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 a sort of literal translation. So it's not great poetry, but you can probably look across and some of the words you will get. How to recite Old English, I'm not an expert, but I'll say if you basically pronounce every single letter and use continental European vowels, Spanish, French, you know, Italian, uh, A, E, I, O, U, you're probably in pretty good shape. There are a couple of weird looking letters. You can assume they make the sound TH. You can see there's a division in the middle of the page, in the middle of the line. That's the sejura that's in every line of the poem. The way this engine is set up, there are two strong beats to the left of the sejura or the gap, and there are two strong beats on the right. I have bolded them. Generally speaking, three of the strong beats alliterate with each other, have the same sound, three Ds, and then there'll be a different fourth sound, maybe a T. Sometimes those uh, sounds are vowels, but often consonants. Anyway, you've got this engine of the alliterative sounds, the D, 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 T. Sometimes you only get two sounds the same, but basically that's the sound system. Very different from most poetry we learn now, like if you're learning sonnet form or something, the syllables don't matter. Uh, down the middle of the page, I've put the number of syllables in four of the lines and you can see nine is the fewest and about 15 is the most. And uh, so syllables don't matter. What matters is the, the alliteration and the strong four beat line. I'm sure Reggie knows where I'm going with this. So um, I will read it aloud in my best old English and then uh, we'll go forward. And uh, let me just make sure I told you everything that you need to know. Looks good. All right, here we go. And I'm gonna sort of emphasize the four beats. Swada driftuman dreaman liftan Erlitvice adet an ongen, fear in a fremen fend on hella, was a grimma guest, grendel hatten, mera merksapas the moras held, fend on festen, fifalkinas erd, one sale where, where do the wheel, season him shippen for shrippen half. In kindness, kin, thon quelm gerek, etche drichten da de his abel slow, ne ye fair heather feather ache in a fair for wreck, method for the mana man kin a fram, zanon on tudras ella on walk on, eltonus on ulfa on orkne as. Swilcha gigantas thou with God of moon and lange thraga he him thus land for yield. Okay, so you can hear the beat, I'm sure, uh, with my somewhat awkward reading. Um, you can see where Cain comes in there in line 107. The line numbers are on the left. Kainas Kina, Cain's kin. Uh, in line 104, fend und fasten, fend and stronghold or fastness. Uh, and then uh, one 102, just to give it a feel, was se grima guest Grendel hatten, was the grim ghost named Grendel. So, you know, we can recognize some of it, uh, but the main thing I want you to have in your head is this sound multiple syllables of varying amounts, the kind of break in the middle of the line, and then this strong alliterative feeling. You notice it's not rhymed, but it is strongly alliterative. Method for the man, man kina fram, that's line 110, M and M and M and F. So that's kind of the way that goes. Okay. So that's the basic engine that we're talking about here. 
Now um, I'm going to move on. I'm going to jump forward 800 years, woohoo, and go to uh, Gerard Manley Hopkins from the mid 19th century. He converted to Catholicism, became a Catholic priest. And I think he used a lot of old English prosody in his work, which is one reason his work is so amazing. For a long time, he was put in with the moderns until they realized, oh, his work was published in the 20th century, but it was actually written in the 19th century. I guess we'd better move him back to the previous volume of the anthology. So that was his fate. Anyway, we're gonna look at his most famous sonnet. A lot of you know it, it's called The Wind Hover. Uh, the Wind Hover is a teeny little, well, it's a small falcon or kestrel, and it hovers with its wings and its tail gracefully until it sees the prey and then it draws everything together and drops. And that's what uh, Hopkins describes. Now Hopkins, I think really sees that if you look into the deepest inmost part of things, the most particularity, the thing that makes that being its own self, the you of you, what you find in the most particular place is God. And that flight and drop is like the hovering and the waiting and then the dropping into discovery. So the big topic is nothing short of how to perceive the divine and how to recognize it and feel it in ourselves. And maybe that's how we fight off the monster. Uh, I'm going to uh, put you back in screen share and I'm going to say here that I have uh, I have bolded the consonants um, so that you can see how that's working. And I'm just going to read it aloud. It's not based in 4-4 rhythm. It's not a rhythm of four beats. There are multiple different numbers of beats. But what I do want is you to hear is the alliteration and the way in which that mimics the hovering of the bird and perhaps mimics our, our struggle to see beyond just to, to be able to pass out of our hover into some kind of understanding of um, the divine. And I also put slashes because I noticed just recently that in fact, there is a kind of a sejura or a break or a divide in every single line of this sonnet. So I added those in. They're not in the middle as they would be in Beowulf, but they're there. And if anybody wants to say this poem while I'm saying it, please do. It's so beautiful. I guess stay on mute, but say it. I caught this, uh, the wind hover to Christ our Lord. I caught this morning, morning's minion, kingdom of daylight's dauphin, dapple dawn drawn falcon in his riding of the rolling level underneath him steady air and striding high there, how he rung upon the rein of a wimpling wing in his ecstasy. Then off, off forth on swing, as a skate's heel sweeps smooth on a bow bend, the hurl and gliding rebuffed the big wind. My heart in hiding stirred for a bird, the achieve of, the mastery of the thing. Brute beauty and valor and act, O oh, air, pride, plume, here, buckle, and the fire that breaks from thee then, a billion times told lovelier, more dangerous, O oh, my chevalier. No wonder of it, sheer plod makes plow down cillian shine, and blue bleak embers, ah, my dear, fall, gall themselves and gash, gold, vermilion. So I, I hope you heard the hovering and then the dive. Uh, and uh, I wanna say that I put in the right, there are two th other things I wanna say. I put on the right, the number of syllables per line. And you can see again, as with Beowulf, it varies between nine and about 15. I'm not sure whether mastery has one, has uh, two or three syllables, so 14 or 15. Uh, syllables. Oh, and then 16, I guess, in the second line. So a huge variation in the number of syllables. Also, this is completely conventionally rhymed as an Italian sonnet. And I must tell you, I read this poem a million times and had it in many classes before I realized this. 
But if you look at the last word of the line, king, riding, striding, wing, swing, gliding, hiding, thing. Here, billion, chevalier, cillion, deer, vermilion. Quite astonishing, because when you're caught up in the poem, you, I, I did not hear that. I just was caught up in the, in the alliteration. All right. So the spectacular Hopkins using some of the same tools. I'm gonna to jump forward another 200 years now to a rap. Uh, this is um, um, Sunday Morning by No Name. And the big topics in this, and I'm just giving you them so that we have some reference to theme, uh, she's fighting against some really big monsters. And I would say the two biggest are kind of the emptiness of consumer culture and also police violence against black bodies. And in this, you'll hear the Skittle bag, which is what Trayvon Martin had in his pocket when he was killed. Um, but note her refrain, which is really quiet and sweet and maybe serves as a kind of a break, uh, gives us a little bit of ease. Um, rap and spoken word artists use this engine that the Beowulf poet used a lot. That is to say, there's a strong beat, fours often. Uh, there is a varying number of syllables per line, no problem, they can fit in or take them out as many as you want, as you would in a song. There's a ton of alliteration, lots and lots of similar consonant and vowel sounds, internal all over the place. And they use, as Hopkins did, they also use rhyme very, very strongly. And you'll hear all of that. Um, in addition, um, there's a lot of wordplay, a complexity, a sort of a, an embroidery effect, a, th a deep fabric of sound. Uh, and No Name uses it here. A uh, couple of examples, apple stores and raffle scores. Okay, they rhyme, but there's a lot of other stuff going on with those sounds. Or skittle bag and riddle at. Not only is, are those sort of great sounds, but the riddle of the skittle bag, of course, is central to the whole problem we find ourselves in. I laid her lyrics out. I typed them up and laid them out four by four with a gap in the middle so it looks like Beowulf. And it does work in the rhythm, it really does. Um, so what I'm gonna do now is um, start the song playing and then quickly try to go over and screen share <laughs> so that I can get you, show you the lyrics lined up. And then after that, I'm just gonna read my poem which will go very quickly. So let me just uh, get myself set up here for Sunday morning by no name, set up as if it's Beowulf. And actually I think it works, it works very well. All right, so uh, first step is to get the song going. So I will do that. And then I'll screen share. Sunday morning and the birds are lovely. Sunday morning and the birds are lovely. Sunday morning and the birds are. All my raps whisper in intelligence, unrelenting irrelevance, chiseled in the sediment, letterman on the late night scene. You don't know the half, Mr. Bubble Bath. Tab jaded in the grass. What's that? A massacre, a mass appeal to Apple stores and raffle scores. I wonder who won win the lottery. And Google Maps can see my house. Yo, I wonder who was watching me. Satellite hypocrisy, like right up the block from me. Right up the doctor fees. Another brown boy down. Another mother crying, cause another brown boy found. And all you wanna do is smoke weed and write songs. Bang, bang, sound like violence. Poverty was made to door frame all the violence. Knock, knock. Guess who's not there? The police. And guess who don't care? The people. Sunday, Sunday morning. And the birds are lovely. Sunday, Sunday morning. And the birds are lovely. Sunday, Sunday morning. And my mama love me. And my Sunday, granny love me. 
Okay. Can you hear me, Reggie? Ah, there you are. So did everyone hear that? Could you see it and hear it? Okay, fantastic. I actually do want to just go back in the share for one second to talk about a couple of things. And again, if you have questions about this, uh, we'll have a moment, I hope, for Q&A in a second. Um, actually, I could just say, I'm sure you heard it. There was a huge variation of the number of syllables per line from four to like 19 or something like that. The four beat line is very strong all the way through. Uh, she's using all the features that I said. Uh, and I think the, the nest of sound makes it really wonderful to uh, front those ideas and make you think about them. Okay, so finally, I'm just gonna read my poem and that's the end. And the odd thing, this goes back to what Jennifer said that the poem reads me, I was, you know, I was supposed to find a poem of my own to read along with this. And I was like, well, you know what? I don't have one. That's ridiculous. I don't know. I want to talk about Beowulf, but I can't figure anything out. I'd been working on Beowulf. I went to back to look at my recent poems. And the first one I looked at, I thought, oh my God, it's totally based on this. It has read me. It has sunk into my body. And I am now embracing this particular kind of work. And I don't know what to say, I was overwhelmed. It had alliteration a lot more than normal. It was uh, very much um, varying numbers of syllables per line. The only thing it didn't have was that it really wasn't in four beats. And so yesterday I said to myself, since this is a poem in process, what if I tried putting it in four beats? So that's what I did and that's what I'm gonna read you now. And I'll just say, this is infectious, folks. I hope you've all caught the bug and will use it in your work or at least look for it. So I'll just end with reading, reading this poem and I will share it, share the screen so you can see it. One line has only three beats and one line has only two beats, but I thought they seemed right, so I left it like that. And here's no name again, and I'm just gonna go down a little moment. This was the old version of my poem and here it is with two beats. The big topic I'm talking about, you see in the title. So, and I mentioned Heraclitus. He's the guy who says you can only, you can never step in the same river twice. He believes that everything is in constant flux, no kidding. And he says that if you reduce everything to its essence, that essence is fire. My pandemic year. The iron tooth descended in spring through fluctuating fires of Heraclitus. We tried to live in the long branches of the white pine shifting its needles in wind. I have cut my tent to the bone. Inside the house, a cellar of riddles with its vein of sugar, its vein of rubble spilling further into the hollow. We have become bleached bats 
hiding our faces as clouds fade. We have become absences, surfeits, toys, foamy flecks, all of us night dwellers, dust of spring. Fear sings from her copper clad tower. How many have died? How many have stood at the gate of the sun, their faces carved by gods and stars? I've weighed my trouble, pinched it tight. I've eaten the tiger, it is within, sparked by a troubling waking cough, my flag of fever, my fuel of wish. Thank you all so much for your patience throughout. And thanks to my fellow speakers today for a really interesting uh, passage. And I hope uh, a couple of people will have questions. Can just unmute and go for it. Maybe there's something in the chat too. I haven't looked. Yeah, I'll look in the chat. Let me see. Um, Superb poem, Cami. <laughs> that's, what some, that's what someone just said. So um, that's my sister. She's a plant. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, yeah. Does anyone have any questions or any thoughts or ideas or comments? That would be great. Well, just a pardon me. Just a generalized comment. Um, <clears throat> no real, no real question. But this has been such a refreshing <clears throat> time this 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 session it, it's um i don't think we often get to consider these kinds of interdisciplinary and cross-cultural and cross-century um bridges very often and especially i mean reggie as you pointed out at the very beginning coming from three very different perspectives different kinds of work so that's my just general comment of praise but it's been, been very invigorating um, and if I if I can get any smarter, I might think of a question, but just to say thank you, it's been, it's been quite fascinating. Thank, thank you, David. I, I just maybe wanted to add something um, because it, it's so much fun to do this together. I, I wish we were all in the same place. Oh. Um, you make me hear things in a different way. And, and I, I don't want to suggest that these things were in my mind automatically when I was reading the Ovid or writing my piece, but that you start to understand how one poem can fit with others. So if the, I off and on this year, I've been thinking about um, learning plants and seasons and calendars at a time of global climate change, when you kind of zero in on what is it and it's being taken away from you. That's been in my mind already. But one of the things, another thing that's really heightened for me, listening bracketed by Cami's and Reggie's presentations, is thinking about names and memorializing. And in the Black Lives Matter movement, the uh, alas, mourning ritual now of saying names that we don't know until the until the person's gone, um, which is very much, I thought, the way that this particular poem hit home because you don't get uh, Persephone's name in the story until after she's been taken away. And of course, that's a very different kind of example. But in the exchange of calling names too, to think of George Floyd calling on his mama uh, in his last minutes, to as a call that goes unanswered. You know, these are all human ways of zeroing in on how to register loss, how to make it feel particular, how to zero in on what's human and make communities out of the larger patterns. So no. I just wanted to say, it really came home to me um, reading in between you both. And that was a huge pleasure. Th thank you, Jennifer. And, and you just made me make a connection between uh, between George, first off, the thing about calling out the names is an African American, an African sort of ritual. Um, very, very often, there's a, we pour water into something living, and we we say libations, right, for for the individuals who are no longer there. You can see this this um, this going back. If you ever see a film called Cooley High, 
going back to the 1960s. Um, they pour out some liquor before they drink and they always say, this is for the brothers who are not here, right? And um, very often, my brother and I do the same thing. It just hit me when you were talking about like George Floyd calling upon his mama before he died. It's like, I can imagine Persephone doing the same thing before being dragged into the underworld, right? Her and Demeter were tight. And, um, and um, before she was, she was brought down into, into the dark space where she would find herself um, in not the land of the living, you know, um, mytho giving this, the, the human shape to, to the myth, I can see that happening as well. Who did she think about? Who did she call out? And I just, one other thing on names, it's a different idea, but you know, I think you heard that the, the name of the rapper who did Sunday Morning is No Name. I mean, she has a, a given name, but she calls herself No Name for a, another reason, which is she does not want to be a brand. And it's mm -hmm. sort of funny because of course you call yourself No Name and that becomes your brand. It's all very, you know, it's difficult to right. escape from it. But I think that's her intention is to say, don't brand me, you know, I am going to call myself No Name. Right. And um, of course, then you have Odysseus, you know, I am nobody, I am no one. Right. Well, I was, I was also gonna say to Reggie, talking about libations, that's originally where the title of our Blood for the Ghosts name of the session from right. uh, this ritual enacted in the Odyssey of, of going to the underworld and bringing blood for the ghosts who are bloodless to have right. them come near at the smell of the blood and 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 tell us something about where we're going um absolutely and i've always loved that part in the in the odyssey as well because he goes and he looks at the ghost of achilles right finds the shade of achilles and it's achilles basically tells him you know he's like you know you were the he, he says to achilles like you were the greatest warrior blah 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 and achilles is like dude <laughs> You know, I, I would rather be the least of men than 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 be revered down here. You know, and and so that's what what Achilles, who 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 wanted all of this his Kleos and 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 Time and himself to be recognized, he realized that that he that maybe there was a part of his life that he wasted. I think Achilles is one of the two people we get in Greek mythology who actually gets to know what his Moira is what his fate is going to be and can actually have a choice in it. And so when, when Thetis, his mother tells him, you know, you, you go to, and the, as the myth goes, if you go to Troy, you don't come back. If you stick around, you, you begin to, to grow. You, you have a family and kids and blah, blah, blah. And of course, in being in warrior culture, he decides I'm gonna go and have my name, you know, uh, spoken about on the lips of men, at least according to the background of the, of the myth. And, um, and in the Odyssey, it, it shows that that's not, he, he found that folly. In, in the end, he was like, maybe, maybe not that, maybe not that. And so I think about that when I've had these arguments with, um, with, with friends, uh, one particular who calls, who, who, who calls the Iliad a gornography, you know? And I'm like, no, you really need to sort of look at that. In the end of the Iliad, there's nobody who you really wanna be, you know? So, so, so think about that, you know, there's no one who you really want to be by the time the Iliad is over with. And it's, it's, it's a huge amount of, of, of trauma that, that folks are, are suffering, except, you know, they don't, they wouldn't have called it that. And so I look at, I don't know if anyone's read Simone Weil's uh, treatment on the Iliad as a form of force. When she speaks about force, of course, being the thing that she thinks is central to the Iliad and, and how the force, force tends to make everything something acted upon right? It doesn't apply humanity to you. And she thinks that that's central to it. And I've argued in my head with Simone Weil about that because I find so much more to it than just it being about force. Of course, force is going to be there because it's a poem about war. It's a poem about what happened. Well, it's set at, in wartime. But when you really look at it, it's about how this changes people when, she really, when you really think about it. We have two sets of Achilles' anger, right? It's the first one, of course, is him being angry because essentially he's a misogynist. And we don't look at that in this culture, that Achilles is angry because he's being denied the right to rape a woman. This is what's actually happening when we open up the beginning of the Iliad. And he's upset and he's angry because, because Agamemnon has taken his war prize away from him. And now he's on the beach pouting and his mother comes to him, there, 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 baby. 
right? And what is he upset about? She was taken away from him. In other words, you don't have, somebody else usurped your right to rape someone. And so he's angry about that. Now, what winds up happening is that's his anger. Simone Vey says it's a form of force, but so much of the death which also occurs in Iliad happens because Achilles refuses to apply force. He takes himself out of the fighting and says, I will not kill. And as a result of that, so many other deaths of the Achaeans begin to happen. And then we see him again with the second episode of anger. And this is, of course, when Patroclus dies. But it's more than anger. His anger has come out of, a, uh, his anger is transformed because now he's feeling guilty. He realizes on a level that his friend died because he didn't fight. He's also feeling, um, I would imagine, he's, he's feeling where well, there's the guilt, he's traumatized, he's grief stricken, right? And so, and then he goes out there and causes a huge amount of death out of his, out of his guilt. But then there's something about that that he, that he backs off of when Priam comes to him and asks for Hector's, Hector's body back. I've often thought on a human level, he probably was thinking about his father Peleus, an old man who would never see his son because Achilles knew he would not come back from war. And so I look at that moment of exchange between them and, 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 and I find such, such a, a, a huge amount of humanity that's right there and all hidden. And of course there's love throughout the Iliad as well, right? There is Achilles for Patroclus, there is Hector and Andromeda and Astyanax, there is uh, Priam for Hector, there is also um, perhaps, perhaps, perhaps um, um, Thetis feels love for Achilles. We don't know, the gods usually don't love anybody, but perhaps she feels love for Achilles, and, and, and which we know she didn't have love for Peleus but perhaps Peleus also, Achilles feels love for Peleus. So it's, it's a very rich thing. And, and I love what you said about that, Jennifer, that eventually, you know, you, these, these pieces, you're never the same person once you begin to engage with them again, because there's always another door you can enter and see the house from a different perspective. I'd like to um, call, give a call out to George Calgaris there in the gallery, because, uh, you know, one of the things that was remarkable in Reggie's and Cammy's is the sound, the meter picking up. One of the things I feel encouraged by is the work that George has done uh, in his book, Guide to Greece, in, in so many of his poems, uh, saying, what's the challenge as the years go by of coming through a written guide and what difference does it make to go to a place and how do these things come through in our families and the words we say and the names we use that way. And, and again and again, George's work has been a really inspiring model for me. So uh, if you don't know it, um, go add that to the mix. So Thank you for, for that. For that. Um, there's a, there's a, a question from uh, Philemo. Yes. Uh... You can say a question. Hi, guys. Uh, my name is hey. Telimo, uh, Wilson Telimo Luis. I am Haitian and I do poetry mostly in Haitian Creole and, uh, and in French. So I'm about to integrate myself into the American culture or literature. And I also published my first poetry book is, uh, titled Taste My Pen. Uh, I try to translate my poems from Haitian Creole or French to English. So I publish on, on Amazon in case you would like to take a look at it because I'm driving now, I can send you the link. So I can feel now that we have a contemporary poet, uh, poetry that prioritize uh, prose, prose and poetry. Uh, we mostly used to do versification, like when you try to rhyme our poems, our verse. So I'm wondering, if, like, what do you think on doing classical poetry versus contemporary poetry that gives you the freedom to say anything you want to say freely without even um, contextualize anything or work like, like I just saw your presentation. I really like the presentation. I feel like I'm in my plate since I mostly do, I mostly write my poems like that, try to, uh, rhymes and also uh, measure my my verse. So what do you think of uh, classical and com contemporary poetry? 
that should be my question. So what do we think of classical and contemporary poetry? Yeah. Should we leave poets like write whatever they want without uh -huh. having respecting their wool, the rules that we used to use in poetry in the past? Or like, like yeah, what do you think? I think I think I'm sorry, go ahead, Cammy, please. You know, I can say just based on this experience I just had that a lot of times I think, well, I'm reading all this stuff. It's from really long ago. It thrills me. I love doing it, but I don't know what it says to whatever I'm doing now as a poet. And of course, that's ridiculous. You get completely infiltrated by whatever it is that you're reading and obsessing on, and it can only help you. So I think maybe there's a, it's, you know, it's a continuum. And I, as I say, I was so shocked by realizing that I was working in this way, uh, sort of, it, I had Beowulf in my bones, as it were, in my, uh, just there to use. Um, so I think that's one of the great pleasures of it. Yeah, I, I think too, too, Cami, especially with what you were doing, you, you were showing us how this rhythm has, has been taken on um, from, from Beowulf onward. And, and I guess, Talimo, I, I think like in what Cami showed us sonically with the sound, we see that, that poetry can often be um, a dialogue that is spoken over, over time, right? And so drawing the connection between what's happening in the past and what's happening now, and also the understanding that people felt the way then that we, that we do now, maybe not as much angst as we might feel, but maybe more so in different in different ways. Now, to answer your other, what I think is the subject of your question more directly, um, I'm down with poetry that has rules and poetry that doesn't have any rules. Um, what I what I what what I tend to pull toward is things that make me feel or think. I like to be affected by by the work, and so no, it doesn't matter to me whether it rhymes or whether it doesn't. The issue though in rhyming is that is that it can get a little bit repetitive and a little bit monotonous. But but no, it, it really doesn't does not matter to me whether it adheres to particular rules. Um, but I do like to be engaged by it, you know, no matter what what the rules might be. Well, I, I thought that was a great response to it's not, you know, the rules are just a jungle gym to play on, you know, uh, that there are all kinds of ways of absorbing them, ignoring them, rejecting them, departing from them. It's like if you have if you have a beat, the beat is there, so we notice when the beat changes, too, and 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 that's exciting. And I, I guess for myself, whenever I'm writing, I think I have a plan, but whatever really happens is the most persuasive digression from mm. the plan. And I, I kind that. of need to have both. I need to have where I think I'm going because I need to have a strong pull in one direction so that when something, when my aha comes up, it, it, it it's engaged with that, it's in conversation with that. So. You no, know, Jennifer, that's great because it's a lot like that in jazz, right? Where there's a progression that we're following and we expect a, a, a natural, another note to, to sort of follow that, but then someone takes that away from us. And it sort of shifts us a bit. And we're like, whoa, you know, I wasn't really expecting expecting that to happen. And, and it opens one up rather than closes one down when it does that. There's an expectation and there's also the surprise that 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 happens with it that 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 I love when I come into contact with that. Sorry, well, I think that's, I, oh, go ahead. No, no, go, go, please, please, please. I just thought I cut Cammy off. Please, please, Jennifer. Oh, I was just, I think Lloyd's been trying. I think he's had his hand oh. up down there. So I I think, oh, okay. okay. Go ahead, Lloyd. Oh, I just wanted to thank you. Um, and and um, my, my, my first thought about this whole, uh, this, this wonderful discussion and your, your readings um, is, uh, is this, content, this continuum of poetry that goes back so many, you know, now thousands of years and how connected it all is. And uh, you know, it, it suddenly occurred to me about um, you know Harold Bloom, you know, and the anxiety of influence, yeah, yeah. and and that just seems nonsense. Uh, forgive me, um, uh, academic gods, but that seems <laughs> nonsense in relation to how interconnected and how much poetry relates to 
poetry over not just who your immediate ancestors are, but 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 whatever you read and however far back it goes. Um, I also had another thought because I had a I had a and this is about names, and I I I wanted to come come close to something um, to a note that I got from Cami a few days ago. Um, and uh, we were talking about Yeats's uh, Easter 1916, and Cami was was saying that um, you know there's a list of names near the end of the poem about the 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 martyrs or the people who were killed in the in the Easter Rebellion, and that. Cami, correct me if I'm if I'm if I'm misrepresenting you or misquoting you, but that you t you told me that you were moved by that list of names even before you knew who the names were, who the people were, whose names they were, and and I had exactly that same experience that there was something profound in the just the fact that the names themselves were listed, which reminded me of Homer. And, and that I don't, I mean, I actually, because I studied Yeats and I read the footnotes and I know who those, those Irish patriots were, but in, in, in Homer, most of the, except for the very famous names, the, I don't know who they are. But the fact of their deaths or their membership in the in the in in in, in the war, or whatever else they happen to be listed for, just that list of names, the fact that there's a list of names, is incredibly profound. It's incredibly moving. It's not just well, a lot of people were killed in this <laughs> war. It's this one and that one, uh, and that in the same way that we are, you know, that we're, how important it is to list the names of our recent um, losses. Mm. Uh, and that, you know, they're not necessarily people we know, but we know about, or some of them we don't know about, uh, and how, how profound it is that each individual be be named. Anyway, I love this discussion. Thank and, you, and, thank and, you. And thank you all so much. Um, Thanks, Lord. I, I'd like to give two, two loves out. First off to, to Jennifer, thank you for using Delaire's Book of Myths. It, it, is, it is one of my favorites. And, and um, I recommend if you don't have it, if you got grandchildren, you want them to have that book. <laughs> it is a wonderful book. Um, and I absolutely love it. And um, Cami, um, I didn't notice it before, like in, in the in the sonnet by by um, by Hopkins. You know um, what all you brought up, you know about him. I had never really looked at it before. Of course, I'd always seen the alliteration, the alliteration, but never really connected it uh, directly to the to the Anglo-Saxon. Um, but I also, but I did see see that he in that poem had Kennings. Right, you know, double and one triple word kenning uh, construction. What was I wrote it down? It was um, dapple dawn drawn. Right, an alliterative kenning, and then he had he had another one, the the uh, the, the um, bow bend blue blue bleak. Right, all of this this alliterative sound making a kenning at the same time he's making that, and when you mentioned the apple, uh, we're getting to to no names work, apple stores and raffle scores. Did it put anybody else in the mind of, of Seamus Haney? Who, who does that a lot, uh, but always at the right time, I think in much of, of much of his work, where he'll rhyme that. And um, there are a couple of rappers who, I'll send you some stuff, these guys rhyme entire paragraphs, okay? Like, or whole sentences where they rhyme this stuff. And it's just incredible. It's like, how does your mind work like that? Right, and it's this vertical thing which is going down, and it's just phonics that just keep relentlessly coming over you, 
And um, so I want to thank I want to thank you for bringing that, and also thanks thanks to Jennifer for bringing that, you know, bringing us into that as well. Um, yeah, I didn't know much about the Fosti, uh, uh, you know, at all. Like you say, it, it, it's like the B cuts, you know, <laughs> it's the B side of the album or something. It's sort the of outtakes. like the uh, almond poor Richard poor Richard's almanac because I did I only give you a sample there, but it's got. It's, it's as if you were trying to say, this is why we, this is garbage day and this is uh, <laughs> inauguration day and this is St. Patrick's day and this is my mom's birthday. And it, it cuts back and forth between all those things. And you really feel that he's, he's way after the Greeks. He's, he's writing already to excavate um, and not just the Greeks, traditions from a lot of different places, as well as the Julian calendar, which went into place two years before Ovid was born, is, is basically the one we're working from now. But even that was an amalgam of different kinds of adjusted traditions. And to talk about names, you know, October, November, December, that's the eighth, ninth, and 10th month. There, it used to be a 10 month year beginning with March. March uh, named for the god Mars because he's the god of war because a spring is a good time to go to war. You know, but so, so when he asks <laughs> a question about May, made it, you know, and then August, August for Augustus, July for, you know, you, if you even look at our calendar, it still got plugged into it. All these different non-symptomatic ways of tracing back roots to different things. To say nothing of the different times they had to plug in a day for a leap year or when they made adjustments because their month, which was just a, their year, which was based on lunar months, was then out of sync with the beginning of the year and they needed to recalculate. Again, I think I think about it because we're virtually connected as if with no time zones and our calendars are really strange this year but the seasons are even stranger and more helter skelter and even mm -hmm. what you might think of as a constant through calendars doesn't apply so i really think of calendar making as a, a a community building project and i think that's why it's a it's a difficult poem to read for ovid because it's really responding to social and political issues in his moment but mm -hmm. i think about it too if you have um the day that people go to the Capitol to read the results of the election of a new president. And that's a tradition that both uh, embodies and reminds us of the meaning of the roots of our democracy. And then you have it challenged in a particular place and in a particular time. It makes us ask, is this a mere tradition? And why is it located in this place, this building, these people? Anyway, our, that capital and the Capitoline in Rome, you know, they're, they're, they're all kinds of visible and invisible ways we're linked to these old things. And, and you could enter from so many different directions. So. Mm. Yeah, thank you for that. Oh, Lloyd, please. Well, I just have a quick question for Cami, and maybe, maybe you don't want to answer this. <laughs> in, oh, in public, but I'm sort of curious <laughs> what you think of Seamus Heaney's uh, translation of Beowulf. It's terrific. Oh, good. I mean, I, I have many of them. This is a wild and radical new one by Maria Davina Headley. This is an old one by uh, Howell Chickering that I love because the notes are so spectacularly good and it's quite exact to the poem. This is Heaney's, which is graceful and lovely. He sticks to the beat. I don't, he's not always as alliterative as I might want him to be. This book I found recently, this is amazing. It is a word for word translation. So if you don't know your old English as I do not, you can simply go across to the other side and see the exact word it is. It doesn't work very well as poetry, but it's absolutely terrific aid. Um, so I would say they're all good in their different ways. And um, what do you think? Do you like Heaney's translation? I, I do very much. Uh, I mean, I don't know Old English uh, at all. I know some of the rules, uh, but I, I'm, I'm moved by it and I'm gripped by it. So I, 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 I kind of love reading it 
and I don't have an opinion about, I, I know there is controversy about how accurate it is, but I love reading it. Well, everybody takes their liberties. I, I just have to read you the first word. You know, it begins with this word, what, which in, <laughs> in Old English sort of means pay attention. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to read you the three translations in these three versions. The newest one by the really the wild woman, she says, well, no, I'll go, I'll go backward. The oldest guy begins with the word, what is his first word is, Listen, then you go to Heaney, oh. more modern, and he says, so. so. <laughs> and then you go to Maria Davina Headley, who's really got the kind of warrior culture thing down. And her first read is, bro, <laughs> <laughs> bro, tell me we still know how to speak of kings. So they're all good in their different ways, but I could see how you could be terribly annoyed by them too, you know, their translations. So they, they differ. Um, and I guess the, the translation of the literal what is what. So that's the, the guy who just does word for word. He starts with what? No, Cammy, I think that's what? What? <laughs> what? Anyway, what? I feel you've, you've all been incredibly uh, patient. And yeah. this is a long haul. After an hour, I feel like my brain turns into mush. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very impressed by people's comments. I know Lloyd's going like this, and I think, yeah, exactly. No, 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 no. I'm 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 just starting to oh. to, think, to take in everything that 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 you've said. Yeah. So, no, I don't mean wrap it up. I mean I I really. Oh no! I thought you meant whack. You know, I feel like I get. Oh, no, whacked no, 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 no. That's not what I meant. It's just. Oh, oh, got it. Is just you're just you know, getting just rolling. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, we could end it here, but I I wouldn't mind. We got ten minutes. I, mean, I, wanted, I would I love wanted, to hear from people. I want to just drop in one last thing because we can't go there. But the part of the story that Ovid tells in the Fosti that he doesn't tell in the Metamorphoses while Ceres is wandering around the world looking for her daughter, she goes uh, to the house of, in the Fosti, he's just a peasant. Uh, he and his daughter meet her while she's out walking and they say, come home with us. Um, our baby is sick at home. And they kind of bond over the idea of children in distress. And Ceres is a goddess. She comes in, she kisses the baby on the mouth and ta-da, he's healed. And everybody goes to sleep very comfy. And in the middle of the night, Ceres puts the baby in the fire. And, and the mom wakes up and says, what are you doing? <laughs> And Sirius says, well, you shouldn't have interrupted me because if I could have finished this ritual, he would have lived forever. But now he'll just have an ordinary human lifespan and he can become my priest and in charge of the crops and the cycle of the seasons. Anyway, it's so I went back to the metamorphoses. It's not there. It's told in quite different versions in other places. And again, um, uh, there's that kind of weirdness ready mm -hmm. to jump out of the stories that you think you know. But to me, it said, why wouldn't you want to make your child live forever? And that the goddess might feel that and a human might want to. But there's some kind of killing of the actual human. I mean, what we are is born to die and to say everybody's name along the way. So right. we feel that it matters while we're here and that it matters when we go, you know, right. a different rhythm. Right, there's a, and, and perhaps George can, can correct me about this, but there is um, the Thinitoi and the Athenitoi, right? Yeah, the right. the, the Thinitoi are the gods, those the, uh, are, um, are us, right? We're, we're the ones, we are the ones who are consigned to death. We must die, right? And then there's the ethnic toy, who were the gods, the ones who cannot die, right? And so um, for for us, that's who we write for, right? <laughs> we write we write for those for those who must die, who have no other choice but to die. That is our consignment, is 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 to dust, and um, and that's why they would say the gods envy us, <laughs> because we're beautiful for just a little while, and they have to be bored for freaking ever. That's, that's beautiful, uh, Reggie. It's really beautifully put. Um, Kavafi, uh, Jennifer, has a poem. 
I think it's uh, the literal translation of his interruption about that story of the baby. Uh, but this has been a really fantastic uh, event. And I kept thinking of, of Virgil and his phrase from one of the shepherds, which is song replying to song in David Ferry's great translation. And of course, Virgil's responding to the Greek texts. And there is this continuation of song replying to song all the way down to these beautiful rap songs. Um, and just one other thing um, about Lloyd's wonderful perception. Uh, I know Reggie knows this very well, but book two is the catalog of ships, which is all names. Yep. And um, some find that a chapter to skip, a book to skip, but <laughs> I always find it beautiful because of the, there's a lot of controversy about it, but it may be, it may have occurred at a moment when after a dark ages, uh, the Greek language was rejuvenating itself and Homer's delighting in those consonants and vowels of the names, the people from the particular places and the sense that no one will die uh, anonymous in the text. So thank you all very much. Absolutely, thank you, George, for, for that. Thank you, George. I mean, I, I just have one more thought, which is that this um, question of the, or this certainty of the finality of death. I was thinking of that poem by Robert Browning, whose long title I can't quite quote. Karshish, the physician, is in there. But it's this physician, an Arab physician, who interviews Lazarus after he's come back from the dead. And it's, Lazarus has been so uh, disrupted by that experience. Um, he should have died, but he came back. What does that mean to be living again when you have died? Uh, it's not a thing that is for humans. Um, so the border between life and death is not really supposed to be breached by us. And uh, yet it happened to that man because of Jesus. The actions of the gods, I guess, you know, they, they put you in the fire. How do you know what that could possibly mean? Of course, if you're the mother, you grab your baby out of the fire. Mm -hmm. it wouldn't occur to you that the God would have some other plan. Well, you might hold him by his Achilles tendon. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and where the mother holds him, then he's vulnerable. Then he's vulnerable. Yeah. Yeah. Don't hover. <laughs> don't, <laughs> don't be a hovering parent. You'll make your kids weak. <laughs> Let them go Jennifer, through the fire on their own. Jennifer, I'm wondering, do you know Frank Bedart's The Second Hour of the Night? Yeah. Uh, which is uh, a, a very, very long poem. And the major episode in the poem is, is from Ovid. It's the story of Mira. Yes. And uh, I think it's one of the great uh, contemporary versions of, uh, uh, of Ovid. Yes, it's, it's a good one too, because again, back to Calvino's point that when you think about the story as you've received it, as you've conventionally received it, and then you go back to the way it's told, there are always things to discover. And, and Bedart's version of the Mira story really highlights, um, people are always putting a moral on Ovid that is always more stable than the story itself. And one of the things that's really good about uh, Bedart's take on that story is he, he opens it back up again to real moral ambiguities and, and feeling torn by there not being a position you can take. And again, the, the transmission of Ovid through the centuries is people choosing a part with a finished moral and not seeing how often he goes on to destabilize it. And that, that's really exciting. It also says something to us about, we want literature to tell us how to behave, but anything you get from anything that's written, you still have to really adapt and do the work and make it live in your circumstances. So that's um, part of the story too. That was, that was beautiful, Jennifer. Thank you, Lloyd, for, for stimulating us to, to such conversation. Um, I think we're about to close it off, but uh, but with George, I want to thank you for bringing up Kavafi. Kavafi, I have a um, a bag here that was given to me as a gift, and on it is a portion of Ithaca by Kavafi. So perhaps I'll end reading this bag. <laughs>
as you let out for if Ithaca. that's your bag, Reggie. <laughs> it is indeed, Jennifer. Papa's as got you, a brand new bag. Sorry, Papa's got a brand new bag. <laughs> as you let out for Ithaca, hope your road is a long one, full of adventure, full of discovery. Lestragonians, Cyclops, angry Poseidon, don't be afraid of them. You will never find things that like that on your way, as long as you keep your thoughts raised high, as long as a rare excitement stirs your spirit and your body. Lestragonians, Cyclops, wild Poseidon, you won't encounter them unless you bring them along inside your soul, unless your soul lets them up in front of you. Beautiful, so, Reggie. Hey, Kavafi. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for being part of this. Uh, maybe we'll do this again. This is called The Blood of Ghosts, which I would thank you. Which one of you gave us that title? I don't know who it was, but that was a beautiful title. I forgot where it came from. I forgot where it came from. But anyway, thank you. I think thank it you. came from you, Reggie. <laughs> I don't remember. It, but, it, came from, it came from the Homer and it came from something Pam said about right, the Homer, right. but. Well, thank you. So again, thanks for staying with us. So happy to be a part of this. Thank you, Mary and NEPC for allowing this to happen. And uh, I'm excited. And um, I got some new stuff to read and some new things to check out. And hopefully you do as well. So be well today. Get outside. It's beautiful. Go and walk around or crawl around or do whatever it is you do around. But but have 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 this day inside of you. So we'll see everyone soon, I hope, on the other side. Good night, everybody. Thanks, Good afternoon. Everybody. Thank you, Mary. Good night. Thank you very much. <laughs> Take care. Thank you.